Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for the second in a 13-part series as we journey chapter by chapter through Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry. We are here uh, for part two, the second chapter, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about what happened in the chapter. We're going to discuss the chapter itself and then the literary stuff in the chapter, and then I've got another part of this series that I've added um, because I'm just going to have to address this on each and every episode because of the way that reading this book goes. So what happened in the second chapter herein? We meet Yvonne. Uh, we fall back in time to the prior year when she visited. She came back to visit Quanawak. Quanawak. Quanawanawak. Quanawak. 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 Um, in an attempt to save or mend a marriage that she already knows, that she knows is already ended. She knows it is without repair. It is beyond repair. She finds Joffrey, uh, who seems to be this in the same state, which was the reason for which Yvonne left. Um, then they walk around a little bit, and they talk a little bit. Action-wise, that's this chapter. Action-wise, that's what we've got going on. Um, but much like with William Faulkner, our story is basically, seems to be at this point, obviously, I, I, I don't know 100%. This is my first interaction, A, with the book, and B, with Malcolm Lowry. It seems to be that our characters are traveling beacons that transmit their past. Does that make any sense? Basically, the action that's happening inside the chapters is not what we're here for. What we're here for is the stuff that's going on in the characters' heads while they do whatever they're doing, while they go wherever they're going, and while they say whatever they're saying. Um, so we have, at the beginning of this second chapter, uh, you can see the highlights there, how this dialogue is separated, but I'm just going to read the dialogue back and forth uh, without the um, interspersed narrative. A corpse will be transported by express. But why, Fernando? Why should a corpse be trans transported by express, do you suppose? Why shouldn't a corpse be transported by express? When something like that pops up in a book that is by an author who obviously knows what they're doing, and so far we have no reason to believe that we're not in competent hands with Lowry, it's not there by mistake. It's not there by accident. It's not there per chance. It is there for a reason. What is this explaining to us? What does this convey? A corpse will be transported by express. Why? He's not in any hurry. He's dead. Um, why shouldn't he be transported in express? Him being dead isn't a reason he shouldn't be, but is it, is it a reason that he should? That it should? Um, I think that part of what we're communicating here is sort of a... There's a... A phrase that I, I learned uh, from people who are in the military, it's hurry up and wait. Um, there is some bit of hurry up and wait feeling to this novel so far. Um, we have La Roule uh, hurrying up, bumbling around, and, and waiting. We have here Yvonne who tried like hell to get back and then just wanders around. Uh, we have a whole lot of, of this. Um, this is a dead relationship. A dead relationship should be transported by express. But why, Fernando, should a dead relationship be transported by express, do you suppose? Well, why shouldn't it? Um, I think that's part of what we're getting into with this phrase. I think that this 
little exchange is something that we're going to want to keep in the front of our minds as we go forward through this text in order to see um, what's going on here. I, th this next note that I have, I couldn't really find, maybe I'm wrong, I couldn't really find a good example for it. Um, nothing that jumped off the page. It's just the feeling that I get from Yvonne. Yvonne seems to present herself in a much more debonair fashion than she interacts with herself. The words that come out of Yvonne's mouth are more debonair. The words that come out of Yvonne's mouth are more high class than the stuff going on in her head. Um, it seems to me that she is constantly in this struggle to present herself in a certain light. Why does she want to be presented in that certain light? Why does she? Because she wants to be seen in that per, in that certain light. Uh, she wants the image of someone who is more debonair, perhaps, uh, than she is in real life. Um, especially now, this isn't. This isn't an example of that, but it's a weird little quirk to Yvonne. On page 50, um, she's asked, have a drink? She does not reply. Or should she? She should. Even though she hated drinking in the morning, she undoubtedly should. Why should she? Is it to take the edge off things? Is it to look debonair, to look um, hoity-toity, to look like someone without a care in the world, even though you have what seems to be a personal rule. I have a personal rule around alcohol. It's a bit wonky now that I work overnights, and I used to not drink if I could see the sun. It was a personal rule. I always told myself, if you can see the sun and you're drinking alcohol, you're an alcoholic. Um, now, I was probably an alcoholic anyway, but as long as I had this rule in my head, I could always say, no, I don't even drink. I don't even day drink. You know, I don't even drink when I can see the sun. Things like that. Um, this seems to be a strange personal rigidity coming from Yvonne that she is um, willing to do away with. She's willing to give up on. Um, it is interesting to see someone attempting to look cool, but also struggling with their own personal rules. This is something we don't often, we don't always get in literature, I think. This is something we don't always get from the, the cool guy. We don't always get the cool guy on the, on the page uh, presenting themselves in this fashion. Um, and that idea of arguing with herself seems to be something that all of the characters to which we've been introduced so far in this novel do. Uh, for if the very simplest one, LaRule wants Yvonne. Yvonne wants Hugh. Yvonne is with Jeffrey. Um, so we have not quite a tryst. Right? We have not quite a lover's triangle, not quite a lover's quarrel even, um, but we have wants. We have wants, uh, we have disparate wants. We have wants spread all over the page here. You have Joffrey who just wants to drink. You have LaRule who ends up wanting to drink. So we've got to, we've got to keep our eye on all of these wants. Wants, 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 wants. Um, so, like I said earlier, a lot of this chapter is, is, um, it's like a homing beacon, just walking around to transmit thoughts from place to place. A lot of wandering around, <sighs> wandering around in the physical sense, as well as the mental sense, Yvonne, as she walks around in this chapter, is completely 
Absent. She's everywhere, but where she's at. Um, and we sort of get we sort of get the idea that that's how all the characters are. Um, in this, this is it's sort of reminding. I, I, it's weird with this novel. the The first chapter reminded me of what if um, Ernest Hemingway wrote The Shining, right? It was just sort of that feel, you know. Um, Ernest Hemingway would leave things much, much more to the imagination than did Stephen King, and he would pick some weird um, sort of um, locale for, in which that this story would that that story would happen. Uh, here, I'm getting a lot of William Faulkner, like I said, with the characters wandering around and everything's going on in their head. The story is not about what's going on physically; it's what's going on psychologically. Um, but it's also reminding me a little bit of Charles Bukowski's writing in that, well, you know, Charles Bukowski or Brett Easton Ellis, I think, Brett Easton Ellis, I think, I don't trust any of these characters, which is like something straight out of Bukowski, but at the same time, I know why I distrust them, and it's because they all seem to be, well... They're all authentic dirtbags, it seems. You know? Um, I've never thought of Bukowski and Brett Easton Ellis together in this light before. But... God damn, that is, that is, that is hard. Because every time I, I uh, realize that, you know, they're, they're a lot like Brett Easton Ellis characters because they're hoity-toity and you can't trust them. But they're a lot like... Charles Bukowski's characters because they all want, 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 want. And they're authentic sleazeballs. You know? Um, I don't know. I, I, I was not planning on, on talking about this. I was basically just making this point that it's about wandering around physically, walking everywhere, don't know where you're going, and you don't know where you're at psychologically, mentally uh, either. Um, and I was going to use that to lead into page 66. This paragraph, the first full paragraph, the street was now absolutely deserted and save for the gushing murmurous gutters that now became like two fierce little streams racing each other. Silent. It reminded her, confusedly, of how her heart's eye, before she'd met Lewis, and when she'd half-imagined the consul back in England, she'd tried to keep Quanwak itself, Quanwak itself, as a sort of safe footway where his phantom could endlessly pace, accompanied only by her own consoling unwanted shadow, above the rising waters of possible catastrophe. Um, this paragraph, that's Yvonne's mental state. Um, her, each side of her brain is racing the other, like that, uh, like those, um, gutters. And they're gutters. Gutters because it is so fully selfish. Um, it reminded her confusedly of how her heart's eye, before she'd met, and by the way, I, I'm doing exactly what this text is doing, interrupting myself mid-sentence with a comma. This type of writing, um, it really helps you to read out loud. If, if you haven't gotten to that point yet, if you're, if you're still, I'm still struggling with it, but it really helps you to read this out loud because it forces it forces the speech part of the language employed on the page, which is fragmented. Speech is almost always fragmented. That's why, like, you've seen probably over the past four years, what, what's his name? Um, last week, tonight, or whatever, the, I can't remember his name. He always, or at least several times, did transcripts of a Trump speech. And of course, it looks like slock when you read it 
word for word verbatim without the emphasis on syllables. Um, but that's not how you hear things. When you listen to Trump, it, you understand what he's talking about, where he's going. If you read his words on the page, you're absolutely not going to. It's that same way with a lot of people. Um, but it's, it's highlighted in that situation. And in the opposite, in the transverse way, it helps to read stuff like this out loud sometimes. If you get through a paragraph and you absolutely don't know what in the high hell just happened, um, reading it out loud will help. I, this is how I got through my, my uh, undergraduate degree in English. There was a lot of stuff that I just couldn't understand until I read it out loud, which made me look like a crazy person in the university library saying they're reading out loud to myself. But hey, I'm a crazy person. The next paragraph from there, then, since the other day, Quanawak had seemed, through emptied, still, different purged, swept clean of the past, with Jeffrey, here alone, but now in the flesh, redeemable, wanting her help. In this little paragraph right there, um, I mean, that's probably 30, 35 words. We switch, we switch, not perspectives, but we switch, we switch the goal of the paragraph. We switch the goal of the language. The goal of the language is to um, understand Joffrey. Before, the previous paragraph, the one we just read, that is so that we understand Yvonne. And we're supposed to understand Yvonne. We're here in this chapter with Yvonne. Uh, this is a, it's a pretty close psychic distance, but it's still third person. And what that means is the, narr the narrator is closer to Yvonne. We're, we're able to see uh, the narrative distance or the uh, psychic distance is how close our narrator is to a character. Psychic distance to Yvonne here is very close. In that first chapter, uh, it was LaRule, right? We were with LaRule. Um, so we switched to Joffrey. In the very next paragraph, and here, Joffrey indeed was not only not alone, not only not wanting her help, but living in the midst of her blame, a blame by which, to all appearances, he was curiously sustained. Now we have Joffrey's motivations, drives. We have Joffrey's um, inner feelings. So we are more closely related in this paragraph to Joffrey. We're more sympathetic to Joffrey, even than we are to Yvonne. Um, and right after that, Yvonne gripped her bag tightly, suddenly lightheaded and barely conscious of the landmarks. In that one little phrase, Yvonne gripped her bag tightly, suddenly lightheaded and barely conscious of the landmarks, we spin back into Yvonne. What we've done here, it's not us. It's not even really the narrator. Um, we have Yvonne leaving herself, finding Joffrey, entering Joffrey, and then spinning back out into herself. Um, this is, what this communicates to me is that our narrator is telling us Yvonne is sympathizing for Joffrey, even though she doesn't want to. Haven't you ever been in a fight with someone and in the midst of that fight, they just look so pitiful. And you know, this person is fighting with me. This person picked this bone because they wanted attention. And then you have to wait, 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 no, no, no. I'm mad here. I'm angry. I'm supposed to be angry here because screw you, right? One of those moments, we've all had those moments, surely. That is how Yvonne is catching herself in this moment. Uh, she's catching herself empathizing with Joffrey. Um, I have a feeling that the reason she's having to catch herself is that Joffrey is deeply troubled. 
and she knows it. And she can't help him, but she still loves him. Um, I have to take a minute to just point out the absolute and utter brilliance, utter brilliance of the fact that what we're doing here is we have Yvonne re-entering this story by returning to a town in which she used to live in order to resurrect a relationship. And the reason that is so brilliant. Have you ever lived somewhere, lived somewhere for a long time, and then left? A lot of times, for a lot of people, the way this happens is that they grow up in their hometown, and then they go off to college. Uh, and then they return some years later to learn that everything is different than they remembered. The brilliance of this in this situation is that what is happening here is that whenever you return to that place you used to live, everything reminds you of a person you used to be. Yvonne has moved on in whatever form, fashion, facet, or manner she has moved on, she has moved on. So when she returns to this former, former uh, residence in order to resurrect a relationship. Everything that she sees is reminding her of someone that she used to be. She used to be a different person. And here she is walking right back into the same relationship that she left. And it feels like everywhere she looks, all she can remember, all that she can think of, are all of the reasons she left. She hasn't gotten Joffrey back. She hasn't gotten Joffrey out of this place. She's returned to this place. She's returned to someone she used to be. That is a feeling. An emo I, that's an emotion for which I don't know if there is a word. It's a feeling I would not be able to translate onto a page. But we have here Lowry, who has done this so brilliantly. And if we want to talk about Lowry's brilliance, fifteen. Fifteen goddamn words in this one chapter, this one little chapter, that I didn't know. I am going to start highlighting all of the words in this damn book that I don't know, but Lowry employs. Newtent. Nuttent. Nuttent. N-U-T-A-N-T. Lapis. Lapis. L-A-P-I-S. Spoom. S-P-U-M-E. Obliquely. I know oblique. I've used oblique. I have never heard obliquely. Spoil, spoliation? S-P-O-L-I-A-T-I-O-N? Jalousies? J-A-L-O-U-S-I-E-S? Wince? W-I-N-Z-E? Windrows? W-I-N-D-R-O-W-S? Floriferous? F-L-O-R-I-F-E-R-O-U-S? Thaumaturgy, T-H-A-U-M-A-T-U-R-G-Y, superlapidary, ruffianly, um, plangently, mien, unpuka. Funny story, plangently, I looked up all of these words. I don't remember any of them. None of them are that great of words. You didn't have to use these words. Lowry, you didn't have to. But when I looked up playing gently, Google has an example of playing gently attached to the definition of the word, as you do. Use it in a sentence, right? The sentence 
that they use for plan gently. I don't have it pulled up. I didn't write it down. I just remember this story. The sentence, for use it in a sentence, when you Google the word plan gently, the sentence is from a Malcolm Lowry story. But it's not this one. So apparently, uh, this mess of words is something this son of a bitch does pretty often. Uh, but that is all I have for this, the second in a 13-part series, journeying chapter by chapter through, and then a review for uh, Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry. I hope to see you back next week for chapter three. If I remember correctly, it's a pretty, it's a big one, I think. Let me, we're looking for page 67 to 97. So we got 30 pages here. We're going to see how many words we get in here that I don't know. See you next week.